many of you here. Thank you for coming. Uh, the financial crisis left such a deep impression on me, my professional life, that for the first three years, I always referred to September the 15th as the uh, day Lehman's crashed, forgetting along the way it was actually the date of my second son's birthday. Um, he, in turn, grew up associating the financial crash with uh, the day that the football sponsors left the back of the shirt. Uh, so it means something different to everyone, but the summer of 2007 certainly saw the first run on a bank in Britain for 150 years. Customers queued outside Northern Rock, those pictures uh, indelibly left on our minds. Last month, Vince Cable, the Lib Dem leader, was amongst those who warned that the UK is on the verge of another credit crunch because, he said, banks have forgotten the lessons of the past. He talked of complacency setting in, of banks allowing unsustainable levels of consumer credit to build. So tonight, as we look back at the events of 10 years ago, we're asking whether we essentially feel a more resilient place. Have we reformed the fin financial system enough? Does it look and feel different in 2017 to 2007? Do you agree that we are now at risk of getting complacent? And perhaps, crucially, we'll be looking at what it changed, what has changed along the way, the political, the social, the, if you like, philosophical landscape, so altered by the crash that it's become embedded in all our understanding of it. Alistair Darling, former chancellor and um, self-described bank manager at one time, told Newsnight, my programme last week, that without the crash, Brexit would never have happened. Has the crash been responsible for Brexit, for Trump, for the rise in populism, or would that just have happened anyway? And how do we view our response to the crash 10 years on? New Labour, Labour saved the banking system, but did they do enough to reassure the public that the system had been, as it were, reset, that the wrongdoers had been punished, not rewarded, that the government was on the public side? What about that conservative majority government that took over two years later? Was austerity the right approach to a country reeling from the crash? Was it, as some would argue, the only choice they had? And do we believe, does the public more widely believe that the financial system has now been properly reformed, recalibrated? Well, tonight, we're going to hear from a fantastic panel of guests. Martin Wolf first, the Associate Editor and Chief Economics Commentator of the Financial Times. Then he'll be passing the baton to Ed Balls, who served in the government at the time of the crash, later as Shadow Chancellor in 2011. Fran Boet is the Director of Positive Money, a research and campaigning organization championing reform of the money and banking system. They have brought us all here tonight. And we will also be asking you to participate. Turn to your neighbor, it's not a fellowship meeting, but it will have a moment when it feels like one, and ask them what they think. What's going through your mind? Do you think we have actually started to reform it? Is that at the root of the big problems we're facing or not? And then there are drinks after for those who can stay too. That is my work for now done. Uh, there will be 40 minutes or so to talk to the panel, but without more ado, Martin Wolf. So, um, I hope there's a presentation there, or at least a few slides. This is very, this has got nothing to do with it whatsoever. So, this is the thing. Ah, good, that's promising. Good. Um, not lots of bullet points, um, but a few pictures that I will be using. I regret to say, I thought the questions that you asked were absolutely wonderful questions, and but I'm not going to answer them. But we can have them in the uh, discussion. If you want my views on the questions you have asked, they are laid out at great length, some would say excessive length, my wife certainly would, in my most recent book called The Shifts and the Shocks, which was, I think, tried as best I could to deal with pretty well all the questions you've asked. I am going to focus on a narrower set of questions which are essentially to do with what's happened to the monetary system and possible options for reform. But it is my view, and it is at length in my book, uh, that indeed 
the financial crisis has an enormous amount, obviously, to do with the political situation we're in, not only in this country, but in the entire Western world. So it, it was a profound political and social event and not just a financial and economic one. What I'm going to do is to try to cover the five questions, well, the four questions, the four points, and then a conclusion um, uh, to, uh, on monetary and financial systems. And it's quite general, though I think all the charts that I will provide relate to the UK. And the reason for that is fairly simple. I am using information we put together uh, when uh, we, when five of us were involved in the, the government's independent commission on banking back in 2010 and 2011. And those charts I find incredibly useful in elucidating where we were when the financial crisis hit. Uh, so that part is UK oriented. So I'm gonna start with why our monetary system failed, monetary and financial system. Secondly, I'll talk about the reforms that we have seen um, since then. I am third, I'm gonna talk about why I think these reforms will fail. Whether they have already failed is an interesting question. I don't quite agree with the characterization you've given of Vince's view, um, because I don't think the first financial crisis in our case was essentially connected to things that happened inside the UK. Indeed, the most important point about the financial sector, as it was back in 2007 and 8, is that it went down together. And uh, one of the great ironies is British banks succeeded in losing more money on American mortgages than they did on British ones. And that's really an important point. Uh, and you might wonder how that happened, but that was indeed the case. Then I'll finally talk about where we might go from here. Some of the very radical ideas that are out there, some of which, one of which in particular I'm sure Fran will talk about. So let me start why our monetary system failed. Well, the history of ca capitalism, certainly uh, of um, financial capitalism, is one of crises. Um, I, uh, there was an IMF study, which you can easily get, published in 2012, which identified 147 independent national or global, or multinational or global crises between 1970 and 2012. And some of them were, for the countries affected, much bigger than the crisis that we experienced in 2008. 7, 8, and 9, 147 banking crises. Um, there was a significant pause in the frequency of banking crises between the late 1930s and the 70s, which is sometimes called uh, the pause. Um, but since then, the frequency and severity of crisis across the world has exploded, and there have been significant financial crises in pretty well uh, every advanced economy. Uh, over that period, um, and many, many developing and emerging countries. And the explanation for these repeated crises is, in my view, fundamentally quite simple. It's uh, a conflict between what the public wants from money and what the private financial institutions that create it are able to provide. And this is a point which is made best by, uh, I think, an excellent American economist called Gary Gordon, which essentially says money at bottom the, the, as an asset is the ultimate store of purchasing power in difficult times. It's what you hold to feel secure in difficult times. In easy times, you can, might hold some other assets which you convert into money, but basically you have money in order to make sure that you can purchase things you need in difficult times. And in difficult times, is precisely when the guarantee of the, 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 the availability of the money that you think you owe own disappears. And it disappears because money is the liability of financial institutions. That's what it is in our system. 95% of the money in our economy is the, are the, consists of the liability of financial institutions. And in difficult times, that is precisely when the soundness of these institutions comes into question. 
So money ceased to be money-like precisely when you most need it to be money. And that's why when things look really worrisome, you get panics and crises. And so the solution we found to that problem is to provide an enormous amount of governmental support of many, many different kinds to the financial institutions to ensure that their liabilities remain money in all circumstances. And since the financial institutions, for their financial institutions, that means their liabilities are essentially guaranteed to a greater or less extent by the state, they are in a perfect money-making machine. Uh, and this didn't happen by accident. It evolved, Andy Haldane is a wonderful materialist, oh, what he calls a red queen's race between the regulators and the governments on the one hand guaranteeing the system and the financial system um, over 100 years, which ended up with the mess we had uh, in 2007, 8, 9, which in my view uh, was the biggest financial crisis there's ever been, the most complete meltdown of the system. Of course, it was solved by the simple means of giving an open-ended government guarantee of the entire balance sheets of the Western financial system. That's what happened. Okay, um, the dangers were completely uh, uh, clear in the run-up of this system, in the run-up to the post-2007 financial crisis. So to give you an example, uh, in the case of UK, total private non-financial sector credit jumped from 110% of GDP in the late 1990s to 180% in 2010 before collapsing back to 140% in uh, the most recent figures I have. Um, and before the crisis, more important perhaps, the aggregate balance sheets of the UK banks, much of them foreign, related to foreign activities, reached five times uh, 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 gross domestic product, which is a roughly 10 times their pre-1970s uh, their, their pre or 1970s norm. So the balance sheet of the, the British banking system exploded in the period of liberalization roughly 10 times relative to UK GDP. More than half of that balance sheet, by the way, was not UK ba related, it was related to foreign assets and foreign activities, uh, both direct and derivative transactions. I've already told you British banks lost more money on um, American mortgages than they lost on British ones, mostly, if I remember correctly, by RBS, which is a very interesting case. And you can see that by um, uh, 2009, the UK banks had exploded to this incredible size. We weren't unique in this. And you'll see there were two other countries very close to us, which you would normally think of as very prudent and sensible countries, Switzerland and Netherlands, and both of them, in both cases, all their major banks collapsed. So they weren't at all different from us. Uh, uh, Denmark had similar problems. I won't even go into what happened to the Irish banking system. All the countries on the far right basically imploded the first one, that didn't really completely implode was France. So that was a pretty fair mess. Now, uh, the second chart indicates the other dimension of what happened in that run-up. And the run-up consisted in the period from 2000 to 2007, an enormous expansion of assets and liabilities of the banking system with essentially no expansion of their shareholders' equity, which is the loss-making capacity, the loss-bearing capacity of a bank. And as you can see, roughly speaking, the leverage of the banking sector in the UK increased from 20 times to 50 times uh, in the period from 2000 to 2007. It is worth noting that even at 20 to 1, banks have very little loss-making capacity. That's the moral hazard point I made earlier. But at 50 to 1, essentially, they have no loss-bearing capacity at all. If the banks hadn't been rescued, they would have had enormous loss, imposed enormous losses on their creditors, which includes you. So the outcome of the crisis has been devastating, as we know. The fiscal costs of the last one for the UK, and that, of course, is not just the banking crisis, but the economic consequences of the banking crisis, which were a lot, very deep recession 
and huge increases in fiscal deficits. I mean, one of my favorite statistics is that in terms of expansion of public sector debt to deal with both the bailout of the banks, but even more the cost of the recession, um, the financial crisis is uh, the fourth most costly fiscal event in British history after the Napoleonic War, the First World War, and the Second World War. So, as I like to say, banks are very expensive. Um, the economic costs have been huge and permanent. I uh, uh, will show that now. So this is uh, a chart which I just put together last week. Um, I apologize for going so long, but I think I've got still 10 minutes. Um, so what I've done here is take IMF data for the UK and the advanced countries. I run a, f a trend growth of these economies from 1980 to 2007 and then extrapolated that trend growth. You can't see that here. And then I took the deviation of, from the trend growth from 1980 to 2007, a very long period, uh, uh, since then as a proportion of the trend. So uh, you will see that the UK economy and the advanced economies generally at 2017 are roughly 17% smaller than they would have been if the trend had continued. Uh, I can't find any comparably expensive event in British economic history. Uh, the, the, even the Great Depression is not comparably destructive uh, in terms of economic output. I leave aside, of course, other deep social consequences, even more so the wars. But today, the British economy is roughly a sixth smaller than it would have been if the pre-crisis trend had continued. I'm not saying the pre-crisis trend was stable. That's another whole set of questions. But it is clear this is a monstrously costly crisis, and we are completely representative of the developed world. There's nothing exceptional about that. That's true of the developed world as a whole. Uh, and because real incomes are so much smaller than everybody expected, lots of people have much smaller real incomes individually than they expected, and we have been sharing out losses. And most of the losses have actually been imposed on perfectly ordinary people. You all know that, and that's why our politics are so miserable. So uh, the cost to the credibility and legitimacy of our elites have been devastating, and this is clearly the main reason for what's been happening to our politics. Um, some argue that this disaster has been mainly to do with shadow banking. It's untrue. The crisis would have not have been nearly as severe if the big banks had not been so heavily involved in trading. They had not been allowed to put gigantic risks of balance sheet, i.e. without any capital against them. They did not have the backing of explicitly and implicitly insured deposits. They did not have implicit guarantees of solvency from the state and the big universal banks had not themselves failed. So this is not a shadow banking crisis, it's a banking crisis. The second question then is what reforms have been imposed? The essence of the official response has been to maintain today's system, I was involved in that in the Independent Commission on Banking, while tightening regulation and imposing tougher penalties on misbehavior. And regulation now covers inter alia capital and liquidity requirements, resolution procedures and the associated structure of debt, industry structure, notably, notably via ring fencing, which we have proposed, industry incentives via controls on bonuses, pay, managerial responsibility, and fines paid by shareholders, massive fines, and industry behavior, notably via macroprudential regulation. It isn't right to say nothing has been done. That's just not true. It's an immense amount of very complicated bells and whistles aimed at preserving the system we had before. Um, and in which an incredibly large number of risk-bearing decisions, decisions relating to risk, are now essentially taken by regulators rather than by the financial sector itself. And this reinforces the basic point that if you provide all this insurance, which we do, then we can't allow these banks to make decisions themselves because they've become quasi-public. And so we have this ridiculous situation where they're notionally private, but are in fact quasi-public, and the public authorities are essentially trying to make risk management decisions for them. I think this is fairly absurd. Um, why the reforms will fail? Well, um, my view is very, very briefly, capital standards are an improvement 
but the capital standards we have now still rely on the idea of risk weighting of assets, which doesn't work, we'll come to that in a moment, and the overall leverage of UK banks, so remarkably less than they were at the peak, is still about 20 or 25 to one. So basically, banks only need to lose four or five percent of their asset value and their buffer. That's still true. Much better than it was before, but they are still incredibly highly leveraged financial system. They are vastly more leveraged than any hedge fund you could imagine. A bank is about as unsound a financial structure as you can imagine. Um, I think they would be impossible without the government guarantees. In their press, uh, 150 years ago, somebody mentioned what happened. Uh, banks normally had uh, leverage ratios of four or five to one, not 20 to one. I think ring fencing should help, but retail banks can easily fail during a crisis. Uh, so I'm not going to argue that just because we've broken out retail banks that necessarily we've made it safer. That's a whole complicated set of issues. I did want to show something about risk weighting. Um, uh, uh, and this is it. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but it is relevant. The uh, basically the idea is we decide how much equity we need in a bank by deciding how risky its assets are. And this is what happened before the crisis. Of course, the banks will tell you that this will never happen again, but this is what happened before the crisis. So the red line shows the estimates of the riskiness of the assets. And the banks were telling themselves and telling the regulators for the four years before the crisis that never before had they had assets as riskless as the ones they were then having. And because the assets were so riskless, they could become much more leveraged, and they were reporting in 2007, they were reporting in 2007 that they were fantastically well capitalized because the risk, their assets were riskless. Their assets were exceptionally riskless at exactly the point about which they were going to go into the biggest financial crisis ever. I think we can conclude that risk weighting doesn't work. Uh, and there are profound reasons for that, methodological ones, which I could go to. I don't think, coming back to the reforms, resolution will not eliminate the possibility of crisis and might increase it. Uh, and the basic reason is once people know that there could be resolution, which means that creditors will lose, the creditors are going to panic. It's a system for triggering panic, in my view. The, um, the controls on pay and other internal incentives, they're always going to get their way around. I don't think macro prudential policy, which I've mentioned, will work. And the most difficult problem with it is that essentially the um, central bank, the Bank of England, is making the risk bearing decisions in macroeconomic policy. Um, and the most, the div biggest problem of all, of course, is that we're already seeing this in the US, is that the banks have an immensely powerful incentive to subvert the regulation. They know they, they, and they have the power and means to do so, and that's what they're doing now. So five years from now, it is a solid bet that the regulations in the US will largely have gone, and once, or a lot of it will gone, and once it happens in the US, the whole thing falls to pieces. So the regulatory structures will not hold. So finally, very briefly, where might we go from here? Well, I think there are three or four proposals that might be worth thinking about in terms of making the system better. The first proposal, which is a rather nice one, is Mervyn King's Pawnbroker for All Seasons. And the idea of, of this one is simply that the value against which the central bank will lend to the banks in a crisis is pre-specified because the collateral has been pre-positioned and they cannot have liquid liability money for you or me um, which exceed the value of the pre-positioned collateral at the haircut that the central bank has imposed. And it's, I think it's a brilliant, simple, small, but brilliant reform, and it will never happen uh, <laughs> because it will really c kill the business. The second set of proposals, which I think, again, won't happen, but are very important, particularly based, Americans have put this away, is massive reductions in leverage in our economies and in our banking system. So reducing leverage back to the sort of levels we had 100 years ago in the banking sector, but also shifting away from mortgages and mortgage type transactions to equity and equity like instruments in supporting house purchase, all the rest of it. Radical set of reforms would substantially reduce the, the fragility of our economies, probably won't happen. The 
final set of proposals, which Fran is going to spell out in detail, are variations on sovereign money, essentially reducing the capacity of the private financial sector to create money through uh, advances, reducing or even eliminating it. There are many ways of doing this, 100% um, uh, reserve requirements or things of this kind, and that would essentially shift you from a private-based monetary system to a government-based monetary system. There are quite a number of different ways you could go about doing this. I've mentioned 100% reserve banking. You could have direct government-created money, in which banks will be the agents for accounts containing government money, which is what positive money has suggested. We could move to a situation in which all of you will be entitled to open an account at the central bank, instead of just banks being able to own an account at the central bank. It's not at all obvious why only banks should be able to open, operate, open an account at the central bank. The central bank is ours. And if you had your account at the central bank, be completely safe, or until the government defaults, which is a, <laughs> a different set of problems. And of course, you could create central bank digital money instead of cash uh, outside the banking system, which again would be completely safe. There are quite a number of options we could now pursue, which would reduce or eliminate in substantial measure the fundamental problem created by the fact that money consists of the liabilities of unsound financial institutions. So, conclusion. Yeah, that's all right. 25 minutes, I said. So, in conclusion, the, the one, the emergence of an immensely highly regulated, which is where we are now, yet cosseted, notionally private, but publicly backed financial system is a perversion of a market economy. If you're a, on the left or the right, you should both agree this makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's neither a market economy nor a proper socialist one. So you, I tend to think you have to have one or the other. The banking system is, and this has been true ever since the bank, central banks were created, is the private beneficiary of a public function guaranteed by a public institution, the central bank, and quite often by the FISC, which is the creation and management of money. It is able to use the vast resources given to it as a result of that link with the state to lobby against regulations it doesn't like. It will in time succeed, and we will then have another monstrous financial crisis. The question is not if, but when. I'm not convinced it's next week. I think Vincent might be wrong, but it will happen. So I would say, in my view, very radical reform is something we should be thinking about. It's not going to happen. In fact, we're going to go the opposite direction. Uh, we're going to deregulate, and that's why we'll have another financial crisis, and our children and grandchildren will probably be having the same discussion 30 or 40 years from now. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
markets are a more powerful source of innovation and change than government planning, and that governments attempt, attempting to centrally plan the economy doesn't tend to work. He taught me that uh, markets can fail, but actually governments can fail as well, and you have to understand the risk of being an active government, and, uh, and that at the extreme, the all-powerful, controlling government uh, tends to, be the, to deliver um, bad economic outcomes and very bad societies, as Martin knew from the history of his family very well. So he taught me a great deal. Um, and 16 years later, 17 years later, in um, July 2017, uh, 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 sorry, in, uh, no, sorry, uh, 15 years later, in July um, 2007, I moved from being um, the financial services minister in July 2007 to uh, being the, 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 the new children's secretary. Um, I can glibly say that when I stopped being financial secretary, um, it was all going fine. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but of course, it wasn't. And um, a quick um, anecdote. Uh, I, the previous December um, in 2006, as the um, Treasury Minister, who had been involved in banking and independence 10 years before, um, I said to Mervyn King and the Treasury and the Bank of England, we needed to know that we were equipped to deal with a crisis if one came along. Would we know how to manage ourselves? And um, I pushed for, and we agreed to have a two-week war game, which happened in July, in January, 2000, in January 2007. And um, the Bank of England came up with a, um, a, a made-up scenario, and we acted it out in real time over a fortnight. And the real-time scenario was that um, suddenly the collateral of a northern building society <laughs> became worthless, actually in this case because of a change in the European court ruling. Um, we decided that we weren't going to intervene because it was a, a building society which was, um, which was not hugely systemic, but it turned out one of our big clearers was very exposed to this. And we ended up with a um, three-hour meeting between myself, Mervyn King, Callum McCarthy, who was head of the Financial Services Authority, and a very difficult meeting because um, I was in the chair, I was the, the, the minister, the chancellor de facto on behalf of Gordon Brown, and um, Callum and I were clear that we couldn't allow the clearing bank to go bust. Mervyn was basically said this is an issue of moral hazard, and um, you know, it should be seen to fail, uh, but that would have meant that the cash machines wouldn't have operated overnight, and the impact upon the wider economy was catastrophic, and um, we were clear that management change had to happen, but we couldn't let that happen. And um, it was decided that uh, we needed to have an intervention to keep this big clearing bank alive. Um, and the proposal for the, from the FSA, uh, supported by the Bank of England, was that we asked ABN AMRO, um, an apparently solid bank um, on the other side of the channel, to come in and take over our ailing clearing bank. And we concluded that um, <coughs> there were big problems in allowing that to happen around state aids, um, which Mervyn thought would, should prevent us doing it, and we thought we should do it anyway and sort out the state aids issue afterwards. We realised our deposit insurance system wasn't up to it, and um, we then concluded we needed to start some work streams to make sure that we were equipped for whenever the crisis occurred, and, um, and then the Northern Rock crisis happened six months later without um, any indication really um, at the time from either the Bank of England or the Treasury that this was about to, to occur. So it wasn't that we weren't looking for it, and it wasn't that we hadn't sorted out what we would do if it happened, um, but the, the Treasury and the financial services regulator and the um, Bank of England didn't see the underlying things which were going, going on. And the same was true in Treasuries and central banks all around the world, in economies which had the tripartite system, economies which had Twin Peaks, where the central bank also controlled the financial uh, regulation. Um, and of course, what actually happened in the crisis over the next um, year and a half was more complicated than our example. Because you did have the Northern Rock example, where there was an issue about consumers worrying about whether their deposits would be safe. But actually, as the crisis unfolded, it became much more international in its dimension. We ended up, as Martin saw on the chart, our clearing bank, hugely exposed, but actually the exposures were international rather than uh, domestic. It was a crisis which actually started in subprime in the housing market in, um, in, in America rather than Britain. Um, I remember a speech Mervyn did in 2006, who, and he was reassured that what was happening 
to monetary aggregates was a sign of the confidence of savers to invest for the long term, um, that low inflation was secure. I mean, at the time, all the indicators which we, w which we were looking for seemed to be benign, and that was, um, in retrospect, a mistake, a huge amount of learning. And the learning has led to, of course, in the end, on this global scale, it was a very classic banking crisis, as Martin said, just a classic banking crisis in a more sophisticated, um, off-budget, shadow banking kind of way, um, and nobody saw the signs. And the road we've gone down is to, um, to try and sort out the road the governments have gone down, try and sort out the financial system um, for the future. And as Martin said, it's a big question as to whether the financial reforms are enough, but they're certainly real and radical. And the screams of investment banks in New York towards and Donald Trump and the new Treasury Secretary shows you they don't like them, um, but then, of course, they would scream, and, of course, they would uh, uh, complain. At this point, you know, that is not the whole story of this financial crisis, and it's not the whole story of the political response. There's no doubt that the populism of the following 10 years is in part the consequence of um, the failure of governments, of uh, elites, um, a word used often by left and right, uh, to deal with that um, crisis. Of course that's true, and Martin said that in his presentation. It's also, though, that it reflects an underlying squeeze on wages in America and Britain and all across the developed world, which precedes the financial crisis. It reflects a growth of inequality, especially at the top, which precedes the financial crisis and is driven by much more complicated things than simply what happened in the financial sector. It also politically reflects... Um, the challenge of globalization being not only about goods and money moving, but people moving. And um, the fact that migration has been such a big part of the popular debate in Britain and America. I mean, that, that is a deeper issue which precedes the financial crisis. That isn't to say the financial crisis is not hugely important. And in Martin's chart, where you see that underlying um, fall in relative trend growth, that could be an overhang to the financial crisis, but it also could be driven by a number of these other deeper secular trends in our economies, which would have happened even if we hadn't had a financial crisis. So there is a debate about how much of that chart is financial crisis driven or not. Anyway, the question Martin poses is, is the regulatory response to the crisis enough, or should you go for this very different proposal, which is to move away from um, our traditional banking system, where you put money in banks and banks lend multiples of that um, to, um, to companies and to individuals and to homeowners? Um, or should you go to this system, as he's advocating, and positive money advocate advocates, where everything has to be matched, whatever you lend has to be matched by a saving? Um, and uh, kind of in the spirit of everything he taught me, you know, one, if Martin thinks something is a good idea, you should take it really seriously. Uh, and also, you should always be open to radical ideas. And so therefore, I genuinely have an open mind about whether, in fact, this is the right solution. I'm not sure, but I have an open mind. The interesting thing about the politics of this, or the economics and the politics of this, is the original proposal for a 100% reserve banking system actually goes back to um, the Chicago School of Economics, to actually the free market right, to the kind of people who preceded, and then Milton Friedman. And the monetarism of the early 1980s was you know, a really clear example of that philosophy in, in action. And it was really based upon two views. One view was that the relationship between money and the economy is actually quite predictable, and therefore it's easy to plan. And secondly, that economies tend to be, free market economies tend to be self-equilibrating. Things get back to normal, and if governments try and do anything, they make things worse. So actually, you should sort of keep out of the way and let um, government um, sort things out. And the reason what, and the failure of monetarism in the early 1980s, I think kind of is pretty much disproved for everybody. The former proposition, clearly the relationship between money and the economy is very complicated and actually what economists would say endogenous. It's actually um, changes, but it actually changes by internal, it, 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 the changes can often be driven internally by what's going on elsewhere in the economy. Um, but there are some people who still think that the free market um, view is right. And um, that's why you still have people on uh, the right advocating this proposal, but also some people on the left who take a very different view, which is that actually this is a way to stop banks undermining the economy and a way from a left of centre point of view that you can take back control. If you are a hardline Keynesian, you probably don't actually care because you think 
Governments are so good at stopping recessions by spending and stimulus that whatever happens, you can sort it out. But actually, most sensible Keynesians don't think like that. So probably Martin and I uh, um, are neither in the extreme Keynesian or free market right. We know monetarism failed. We know there is an inherent uncertainty. But the question is, can you still make what Martin is proposing work? And I think there's, um, there's basically three big questions. Big question one is, um, if you set up the economy in this way, where you can try and control money and manage banks, so banks only do things with these, this quite restrictive set of um, rules of the game, can you be sure that you've actually pinned down what in fact operates as money and can you be sure that you've got all the institutions within your remit which are actually doing what banks traditionally do? And both of those things are really hard because if you go back to the financial crisis in 2007, it wasn't a bank run, it was a repo run which was actually happening outside to some extent the formal banking system. So you, you need to kind of cast your net quite wide. This is quite a hard thing to do because also, as I said, there are banks got into trouble because they were lending internationally. So therefore, it's quite hard to do this in one country. You see, you sort of need to have a one world approach to managing money and to, um, and to matching that to, 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 uh, to liabilities. If you can do it globally and sh be sure every institution is in, then you've got a chance. The more you retreat to one country and try and divorce, div draw an artificial dividing line, you could call it a ring fence, it gets, it gets harder. It's not impossible, but it, it's harder. And the danger is that if actually you have lots of people who are investing outside your control system, because they're trying to get some risk and some reward, and start to get worried that maybe things are getting a bit unsafe, and therefore move their money back into your controlled regulated system, the danger is it becomes proto-cyclical and more destabilizing, so you've got to manage that. Anyway, point one, it's really hard. Point two, the people who have to manage it, I mean, they've got to be really good. I mean, they can't be like Mervyn King and Callum McCarthy and me, because we were doing our best, but we, didn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't see this problem occurring. What you're asking the independent committee to do is incredibly hard. It's incredibly sophisticated. <coughs> um, it's very difficult. The, the flaw in Mervyn's proposal of his pawnbroker is that this pawnbroker has got to have incredible foresight to really know how to make sure it prices risk. And the reason why we failed in the financial crisis is partly because people who were paid huge amounts of money to price risk did it, did it really badly. So it's very difficult. Now, what tends to happen is that um, if you say, well, how, how hard can it be? It tends to be that either you end up with a, a benign view, well, the controlling government will be able to sort this out, which you sometimes hear on the left, although Martin told me to be quite skeptical about controlling government. And also, you have to be, can just cast your net really wide so actually all the, the allocation of public spending and you know, investment and the decision between good and bad capital, these things are all done by this all-powerful committee. Now, I mean, I'm just not totally sure whether this can be, be done, but you, but, but you tell me otherwise. Now, my final point is this, that actually, if you think about trade, well, we've been going backwards in terms of trade. Cooperation uh, on international tax reform, well, actually, that's really slowed down the last six or seven uh, years. Finding ways to manage migration in a way which is good for developing countries and works politically, we've sort of not been succeeding at. Uh, finding a way in which we can make technology work so that it helps the incomes of people in the middle at the bottom. Finding ways in which we can manage our tax systems so we tackle inequality. Those things we've been kind of poor at. We've actually been quite bad at building houses. The only thing actually so far that international cooperation has been quite good at in the last six or seven years is international financial regulatory reform. Um, and so the question is, if you're going to really focus on the right lessons for the global financial crisis and do what needs to be done to turn things around politically, is this the most important issue? Is it the second most important issue? Or would you put all those other things um, before it in your pecking order? Um, and I'm not sure it's the most important issue, but I think it's a important issue. And um, so those, those are my questions. And that, that, that's a reflection of, you know, 
I feel like I'm 23 and sitting at the feet of Martin Wolf and saying, those are the things I'm not sure I fully understand, um, but you may be right. Martin and Ed, um, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not actually going to talk that much about Positive Money's flagship proposal, which is to strip private banks of their power to create money. I very much agree with what Martin said and a lot of what Ed said, although I pick up on a few things and disagree with a few points, and maybe we can get into it in the Q&A. But I think what I do agree with is change is so urgent that we need to be talking about what is happening right now and criticizing it. So that's where I'm at. And I'm not an economist like these two. I'm more of a system change thinker. And so I want to bring in the broader context. Uh, so we're in 2017 and in the UK wages have seen the worst pay decline since the Victorian era. And they've stagnated for the longest time in 200 years or since the Napoleonic Wars. We've got a record high current account deficit, record high asset prices, record high debt to GDP, a lack of demand, secular stagnation, and record low interest rates. Stock markets are hitting all time highs, and in the UK, uh, in the last five years, we've seen a growth in millionaires by 41%. And at the same time, we've got one in eight workers who can't afford three meals a day. Low paid jobs are proliferating, and food bank use is soaring. And of course, this is in a bleak global picture where 1% of the population owns 45% of the world's wealth and scientists tell us that we've got three years left until catastrophic climate change is unleashed. And obviously there are countless more really terrifying and upsetting statistics um, and they're all connected and they are part of, uh, they're symptomatic of deep structural issues and together they paint quite a clear picture that the political economic system of the last few decades, um, commonly known as neoliberalism, is breaking down. And one way to understand what is happening is that we're in the midst of a crisis of economic thinking or political economy. You know, 10 years ago, we had the crash and the dominant school of economic thought, neoclassical economics, failed spectacularly to predict it. And then they failed to say actually how it happened and what we should do next. Ten years on, civil society has responded to an extent. Positive money exists. Great organisations like the Finance Innovation Lab and New Economics Foundation have critiqued the financial sector. And great thinkers have written books critiquing the economic establishment, including Martin's excellent book, The Shifts and the Shocks. But in the halls of power, in the Bank of England, in Whitehall, neoclassical economic thinking still persi persists. The thinking that got us into this mess hasn't gone away. I was on a panel last week, another 10 years event, with a former FSA regulator who was there pre-crash, and he said everyone there believed markets was per were perfect. So much so that the uh, industry is shrinking, so he actually left because he wanted to find a promotion somewhere. But so much so that this idea that um, markets were perfect meant that you couldn't challenge it, and if you did, you were laughed at. And the idea is hopefully absurd to everyone in this room, like, Markets are people, and people are certainly not perfect. But these macroeconomic and finance ideas that were part of the pre-crisis orthodoxy, whether it's the efficient market hypothesis or the rational expectations hypothesis, there's a plethora of evidence to show these aren't correct, but they still persist. And I think the failure to really question the financial markets in 2008 and turn the shock of the crash into a program of reform meant that the financial crisis very quickly morphed into a crisis of government spending. And across the world, we saw governments implementing austerity programs backed by the OECD and the IMF and other um, multilateral institutions so that the people that had done the least to cause the crash suffered the most. And it is clear that the establishment view has at least somewhat reverted to pre-crisis thinking. Mark Carney, uh, the Bank of England governor, has recently made statements where he said that the UK should double the size of the financial sector over the next 25 years. He also said that the uh, UK should become Europe's investment banker post-Brexit. Now, the idea that either of these things are in line with the Bank of England's mission, which is to promote the good of the people of the UK, is completely unfounded. 
there's absolutely no evidence that a large financial sector relative to the size of your economy results in better resource allocation or better returns for savers and investors. If anything, the opposite seems to be the case. The financial sector is inherently rent-seeking, and so its growth is re a result of extracting greater and greater rent from the rest of the economy. This should be a cause for concern and not celebration. So the city's contribution to growth and jobs, although often applauded by politicians, is vastly outweighed by financial instability. And the, the cost of the last crisis is estimated at 7.4 trillion pounds to have costed the UK. And even if we look at bank lending and where it goes in the good times, um, how much of it goes into the productive economy, it's pretty dismal, with less than 10% of new loans going towards businesses. The vast majority is to property and financial markets, which results in the UK economy being skewed towards an oversized financial sector, housing bubbles, asset price inflation, and people are having to rely on taking on more and more debt to top up falling incomes. And despite delivering negligible social benefit, they still receive a massive public subsidy. As Martin spoke about, banks create money when they make loans, and they have this unique privilege. And they're able to do it in the knowledge that if any of those loans go bad, the state will step in to protect citizens' deposits. And this protection means that they can charge really high interest on loans, while at the same time not giving any return to depositors. And this uh, public subsidy, the New Economics Foundation has estimated, is around 25 billion a year. And when there's a recession, the UK taxpayer, the state, will step in and bail them out, which was to the tune of over 130 billion in the crash. But obviously the cost, as I said earlier, was estimated at 7.4 trillion pounds, a vast amount of money. So what can we do? Um, when the UK were dominated by five shareholder banks whose obvious interests are to their shareholders primarily, so that needs to change. But what we should be questioning now is our public institutions, the Bank of England, the Treasury, that should be putting society's interests first, whether they are. And there's a sense that the Bank of England and Treasury understand that we can't go back to pre-crisis finance. So Mark Carney caveated his statement around, about doubling the finance sector by saying that we need tough regulation. So he does think that the finance se sector should be tamed but not changed. And there's clearly not been a discussion in any of those institutions around what is actually the purpose of finance. So my organization, Positive Money, was founded with a radical vision to challenge the way money is created. And we quickly understood two things. That first of all, it was a bit of a taboo to talk about how money is created, less of a taboo now. And secondly, that there's a huge lack of knowledge in this area. And we witnessed that in the election early in the year when Theresa May uh, questioned uh, a nurse and said that the nurse didn't deserve a pay rise because there was no magic money tree. <laughs> <laughs> now clearly it wasn't just Theresa May's lack of understanding of the monetary system that led her to make that statement. There's also political ideology at play. But very few people are aware that there are two large magic money trees. We have commercial banks, they create money when they make loans, and we have central banks. And central banks across the world have been uh, creating vast amounts of money through quantitative easing since the crash. The way QE works is it floods financial markets with money, it, it creates money and buys financial assets from uh, mostly government bonds, and the idea is that it should encourage bank lending, essentially trickle down. It doesn't work. And there's no evidence it's had a very good effect, and it is literally making the rich richer by boosting asset prices. Right after the crash, we probably could have forgiven this policy as maybe being the best tool available in a hurry. But when the Bank of England announced its expansion of QE last August after Brexit, and a, a policy they know will increase the wealth of the top 5% when wealth inequality is threatening social cohesion in the UK, the idea that that is the best that they can do, some of the brightest minds in this country, is completely unacceptable. So we know we need people to shift the debate, and so whilst we uh, like holding debates with very intelligent people and getting the discussion about how we do reform, we also know people power matters. And so we've been, hopefully some people in this room were also with us outside the Bank of England twice. We've mobilized over 10,000 people, and we got the Treasury Select Committee to start an inquiry into monetary policy, questioning ideas like, 
How, why are they doing corporate QE where they pick corporations to buy bonds in? Why are they doing QE when they could be doing alternatives? Monetary financing, QE for people. There's also a range of options. Unfortunately, the queries got shelved because of the election. So now we are calling on Nikki Morgan, who's the new chair of the Treasury Select Committee, to reopen it. And I'd urge all of you to email your MP. I think you can do it via our website. But actually, these things matter. Because in these turbulent and uncertain times, what is clear is that the most important and powerful macroeconomic institutions we have, central banks, are not being adequately scrutinized. And if what emerges from the current breakdown of the system does not seek to democratize central banks and does not seek to democratize the financial sector at large, then it's going to be very difficult for what to emerge to be fairer, more democratic, and more equal. Thank you all. of where we started. The talk is out of the darkness. Can a reformed financial institution solve the world's big problems? What are the world's <coughs> big problems in your eyes, in your mind? And is the right kind of reform taking place to solve them? You can just spend a couple of minutes now. We're not going to listen in. Just um, talk amongst yourselves. Introduce yourself if you haven't done already. Throw something out there. Be big and bold and radical. And uh, then we're going to put them into questions for our panel. Again, um, to get as much in as we can, we've only got half an hour, so keep your thoughts as succinct and as sort of focused to our, uh, to our speakers after you've had that moment to... Right, from all the buzz, we're getting a little bit nervous. You don't actually need us anymore. <laughs> Shh. Um, let me pull you back into the room. This is very encouraging. Um, and I'm going to get uh, asked for some hands now um, to our speakers, to our guests, just to kick us off in the right place. Sir, yes. Uh, Colin Hines from the Green New Deal Group. Um, my major question is, if there is another downfall fast, and Ed Balls is in another little coterie, probably the only thing you will have you, to, you, the only lever you'll have, coterie, grouping of people, the only lever you're likely to have is quantitative easing. You know, the, the central bank magicked up 435 billion pounds, which has gone into asset inflation of the already wealthy. If you had green QE, a 
and we're actually spending that money into environmental work, uh, e energy efficiency, transport, blah, 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 all over the place. You would help tackle the left behind, which is one of the crucial reasons for Brexit, but you would also begin to rebalance the economy towards real things rather than just asset inflation. Advocating green quantitative easing, yeah. I have a lot of sympathy with um, the argument. If you, if you look at what happened between 2007 and 2010, um, the coteries, uh, having not seen the financial crisis in advance, absolutely learned the terrible lessons of 1929, 1933, and went for you know, central banks and governments, big monetary and fiscal stimulus. It was the right thing to do to stop us sl slipping into a, a depression. And the problem was that then went into reverse in 2010 in pretty much every developed economy. The exception was Australia, who, by the way, avoided having a, um, a, a, a recession where everybody else did, and, um, and just said, we're going to do nothing with fiscal. We'll leave it all to monetary policy. And the reality was that once interest rates had gone that low, the only weapon the central banks had left was quantitative easing. I think if it hadn't been for the quantitative easing in that period, we might have seen another much bigger downturn. But you're right, the better thing to have done would have been to have had um, some active fiscal policy. And actually, fiscal policy means governments choosing um, to support the economy. That's a classic Keynesian response. And what could you have done? Well, you could have built houses. You could have invested in green technology. And um, that didn't happen. And I think that was a mistake. Now. I mean, if we had another crisis in this situation with interest rates already very low, you're right, the only um, thing would be fiscal policy. I don't think we will for the reasons Martin said, which is I think um, if there's another big financial crisis, it's probably decades away, but who knows, it might be just around the, um, the cause. I think it's more likely the thing which would cause the crisis to happen somewhat for, 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 or a downturn would be something which we're not looking for, whether it's an, a, a big event or a weather event or something which happens in a um, developing country, maybe a cyber attack, who knows. But, in, but, but whatever it's caused by, I think it's unlikely to be the next one, the financial crisis. Unless governments are going to be more open-minded about fiscal policy, if they try and leave it all to the central banks, it can't be done. So I agree with you. Uh, Fran, do you think that there was an alternative um, to QE in the way it was used last time? Or would you say... You know, this is a black swan, and we just we we needed to pull the levers last year. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I last mean, no, not no, 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 no. no. Oh, in two thousand and nine. When I mean, I kind of understand that it was like they needed to do something fast, and that was perceived by the economic establishment and everyone as an, as an okay tool. So I guess you know potentially that was the best tool available without like shocking all of the markets or getting people like, oh my goodness, what are they doing? But obviously, at the same time, uh, so what? Oh, you think it's a good thing to do? Like it was maybe the best thing that they could okay. have done. Okay. They could have also been ensuring that they were, um, that a, yeah, a fiscal stimulus happened at the same time. But I guess it went on until 2012, after which uh, austerity had started. And there was then this toxic mix of, of QE on the one hand and austerity, which we've seen uh, for the last few years. But I guess, I think on the crisis point, I think we need to get away from needing a perceived crisis like we're still in a kind of long drawn out crisis you know one in eight workers can't afford three meals a day in one of the richest countries in the world if that isn't a crisis then what is and i, I think like part of the problem is in a way when we talk about financial reform we're always trying to have a crash before we go into the reform agenda mm -hmm. and the problem is financial reform has shifted off the the mainstream debate and we need to bring it back but QE yeah. and positive money aren't the answer to that, are they? Well. Um, in the last 30, 40 years, we have um, created, in the world's information system, we've created a much bigger revolution than the one that we're looking for in uh, the monetary system. Um, and um, um, there's, there's a couple of observations related to that. One is that our financial system is still not pluralistic in the sense that a tyranny uh, or feudalism was not pluralistic. Uh, we developed a much more resilient political system by becoming politically much more pluralistic, having more centers of power in different places. So the internet 
um, is pluralistic in the sense that it's not a single network, it's a network of networks. So I've been involved in developing a local currency. We traded about 120,000 pound equivalent over 20 years between a few hundred people in Coventry. We created our own monetary system. We kept score. Um, the system operated about 22 years. We came down to a safe landing. The flight, the flight of the Wright brothers was not a failure because that plane came down to land. So, you know, again, how are we going to think more creatively? We, we do have the opportunity for firewalls with between the networks, um, and, and that comes from the tax system, Thank how that much. works. Just, uh, we've got a lot of hands, so let's just get a few more thoughts in. I'm going to go to, I think I saw you first, the Red Star. That's you. private banking sector. Um, to what extent do you think the fact that they're like patching up this current mess is based on like ignorance of um, so other solutions yeah. or um, greed, short term greed? Great. Okay. And I'll just get the, uh, there's a lady in front of you as well. Can you just pass it forward for one second? Yeah. I wanted to ask, it seems to me that a lot of financial stability is based on our confidence in the system. Um, we need to know that, um, you know, we'll, we'll work for pounds because we believe that, that pounds um, have mm. value. We'll put money in banks because we think we'll get it back. When we're talking about more creative solutions, I wonder to what extent you think that the way that they're framed is a problem. You have how you can, um, how you can frame it to people so that they don't freak out, so that they agree that it's a good system. Great. And there's one more just on this side. Uh, the chap just two rows behind you. I'll keep the mic on that side, and then we'll put them to our panel. I'll come to the middle section and you in a second. Thank yes, you. Sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, looking at the chart that Martin Wolf showed um, early on, he showed that during this period of time when the financial um, system was growing very rapidly, um, the trend growth w was pretty flat. So all this extra... You know, growth in the financial system clearly wasn't contributing anything to the mm. real economy. Yeah, and right, then right. the, the, the second thing, definitely. okay, well, look, I'll just come on to my next part. I was using that as an example. But the main point is that we've got a lot of growth of financial assets, uh, financial growth, which is going into financial assets, not into real economy. So it's going into property price increases, asset price increases, M&A. So this is going into existing assets. And, and I think that's, that's a cause of the, of, the, of the problem that we have because that's where the speculation comes, where the crash happens. And I'm okay. thinking now of ETFs which are currently growing very rapidly. And are you concerned that that's where it, this thing is still going to happen again? Thank you Thank very you. much. Um, Martin, let me go to you first of all. Maybe you can um, start with the middle question. This whole idea of confidence coming in how, in how these sort of radical ideas are broached. Um, yeah, um, there are so many interesting questions that have been raised and that, that uh, um, and we can't really comment on, and some of them are really deeply philosophical. Um, okay, yes, uh, th the monetary and financial system is a confident system, absolutely correct. Um, actually, if you start thinking about it, all social systems are. Um, uh, the government of the UK survives as a government as long as people believe it's the government of the UK. And if we all agreed tomorrow that Theresa May and all the rest of them were not the government of the UK, they would cease to be. Uh, uh, that's one of the most interesting things about human beings. So it's a confidence system. That raises some two interesting points. The first is, as I've described, is break is uh, in the, the nature, it is in the nature of the link between our monetary and financial systems, the sort of the point in a way that Ed was getting at, that confidence will break at precisely the moment that you don't want it to. That's exactly the main point I make. So it is a fundamentally defective system from a confidence point of view. Internally, it cannot provide the confidence that is needed when it's most needed. Only the state can provide it. So the monetary and financial system is ultimately parasitic on the state. Um, it is possible to imagine a system that doesn't have that characteristic, but it is a system radically different. Most of the proposals here, by the way, in different forms, green uh, finance, so forth, all involve more fun state activity, but uh, at least a complete takeover of the system is implicit in these 
suggestions. You asked about um, the uh, attitude of people in the financial system, if I understood it correctly, I may have got the question wrong, uh, to uh, alternatives which don't have these characteristics. My only impression for what it's worth is that most people in the financial system quite literally never think about alternatives because the present system is working very nicely from their point of view. So why should they? Uh, and the essence of, and this is a very real difficulty in thinking about reform more broadly, it's my last point. Um, uh, we can obviously imagine any sort of reform, and they all have lots of problems and questions in terms of the systemic effect, but the main argument against change is always going to be the alternatives to what we have is deeply unfamiliar. If you move to something that is deeply unfamiliar in many dimensions, it will shatter confidence in what we have, and therefore the process of change will itself be wildly destabilizing. And that's a very powerful source but of conservatism. If I bring Ed in, uh, this I think goes to the heart of your point, which is the people that were patching it up, and I think that was a very <laughs> carefully chosen verb, were driven by ignorance or greed. Would you, w is that too far? Would you no, tell us broadly no, why? No, and I, th I, think, I think where I absolutely agree with um, uh, what Martin just said is that in the end it comes down to, the, the confidence will come from government leadership. Um, that's the, that's the, the important thing. I remember very early on in my time as Shadow Chancellor going to a city seminar where one person, this was at the extreme, so this, is, this isn't totally representative, but a very senior banker says to me, I don't know why you politicians keep going on about the banks all the time. The public don't really care about the banks. Housewives are more bothered about the supermarkets. They're the real enemies. And I said, actually, oh, we want names. No, no, and I said, <laughs> I think, I think, said, I think this is totally to, to, to not get where people are and my constituents. And, um, and, I, and I think there is absolutely a group of people, not just in the financial services sector, but also in some governments and in some parts of business who just think if they wait long enough, we can go back to how things were before. And the right thing to do is to keep the heads down. And for some of them, going back to, to, um, to how things were before, you could describe as neoliberal. It's basically a sort of an anti-government, more free market, things will sort themselves out and wealth will trickle down. Now my personal view is it is impossible to see us getting back to stability, growth and fairness by going back to anything which you might call neoliberal and free market. In fact, all of my life I was battling against um, those right of centre forces. I was um, very critical of monetarism, it's partly why I'm bit cautious about the positive money proposals, although I want to understand them and discuss them more, because that is sort of where they, they come from, from that, from that view of the, the world. But the only solutions, they're not going to happen from individual governments. There's something individual governments can do. Individual governments can tackle food banks by changing the tax system. But if you want to have a financial system which is stable, to tackle the environment, to actually make trade work fairly, to make companies pay their fair share of taxes, that means governments coming together to cooperate. And at the moment we have an American president whose American first rhetoric is anti-cooperation. We have a British government which is currently walking away from international cooperation uh, in Europe. We have a, I don't think the G20, the G7, the IMF, the World Bank have been weaker in my lifetime as international fora. Unless you have governments coming together to deliver a collective agenda about change, I don't think we can get confidence back. That is, I think, the thing which has to happen. Let me get a few more hands. There's lots of people. Yes, uh, you, Madam, in the uh, blue. Um, I wonder whether you know about the model that uh, happens in the Bank of North Dakota, which uh, has been taken over by the government. And they do do this. Uh, they, they manage it for the benefit of the people. So they don't have this banksterism. And uh, Ellen Brown blogs about it all the time. If any of you want to know about it, I'll forward you the information. Great. It's a model that seems to work better. If you just, thank you. If you just pass the mic forward to this. Yep. Uh, Anthony Malloy from the Labour Land Campaign. But like all of these questions, it seems to me that there's a lot of, lot of the problems arise from unhealthy interaction between the rent-seeking, asset-based economy and the productive real economy. Is there any way of uncoupling those two, maybe? Excellent. A decoupling. Okay, thank you for being brief. You, sir, right there. 
Okay, very simply, isn't it? But all we have to do is take away the wealth socially conceived with confidence from the people who appear to have it at the moment and re redistribute it and back how would you to do people that? in the middle. How would you do that? Um, okay. Hartley level sorts levels of taxes would okay. be one thing. Inheritance tax would be another thing. A lot more public transparency and anger uh, about okay. the situation. Fine. And I could go let's on. just, yes, sir, you've been very patient. If you look at given, given that our money exists as the debts of the banks on which interest is payable, is it not the case that even if every man, woman and child in this country worked 100 hours a week, we would still owe more money, bank to the mon money to the banks than we have? And does the panel think that's reasonable? Owe more money back to the banks. Um, do you want to answer that one? Or do or do you, I know you don't. Do you not? I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm I can answer go it. Go on then. Um, so your question was debt to the banks, do we pay interest on uh, all of the money that we owe to the banks? So I think there's, I mean, there's always this conversation that um, it's a debt-based monetary system that means we have to grow. Is that what you're getting at? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, we're, we're getting a, I mean, I think there's just, it's unfair on multiple levels. Um, and I think absolutely the fact that we basically all rent our money from the banking system is one of the key um, points that positive money makes. It's, it's a massive public subsidy that actually the private banks shouldn't be getting. Um, am I allowed to make a few general comments, Emily, Can and I come back pose to a couple ask, of questions to these two? I'm going to something to Ed, okay. just at, at this point, because a, a, a lot of the questions that we're getting, Ed, is, is pointing in a... In a let's say, in a Corbynist direction, okay? It's about redistribution. Am I wrong? Am I wrong here? Uh, okay. Well, the questions that we're getting is about redistribution, is about end the inheritance tax, is about higher levels of taxation, end the inequality. I'm wondering whether you think that there was a point at which Labour, and I know you're only in power for another two years after that crash, but there was a point at which Labour could have reset, reset the whole economic terms after the banking crash and said, you know what? that, you know, what was wrong was wrong before and it needs re recalibrating. I'm worried about um, the, the, the politics which we think about the financial crisis. And I talked about the kind of things which have driven that, which were around slow growth, slow growth in wages, rising inequality, rising working poverty, um, unfairness in trade. Uh, and um, so I just think you have to kind of decouple that from the issues around financial regulation and look across the piece. I was part of, after 1997, a government which did more um, to reduce child poverty and tackle inequality than any government, Labour or Conservative, since 1945. 45 to 51 definitely did more than us because of the National Health Service and because of uh, the introduction of the welfare state. We were definitely second. What we did was, in terms of the introduction of the national minimum wage and tax credits, was, and, okay, that's... You don't believe me? Okay. Okay. I'm just telling you the truth as far as I see it. We reduced, uh, uh, child poverty doubled under Margaret Thatcher in a, a right of centre economics, and we reduced child poverty between different def definitions, either um, 600,000 or 1.2 million, depending, depending how you measure it, but it came down very substantially. We raised taxes in 2001, raised national insurance, not because we had failed on the economy, which is why most governments raise taxes. We raised them because we made a positive argument to the country that we wanted to invest more in the National Health Service. Now, uh, uh, I um, would agree with, with some of the things Jeremy Corbyn says. I personally want tougher regulation of the banks. Uh, I'm not personally sure that nationalizing the banks is the right way forward, but um, you know, we can debate those things. So, um, uh, but the broader point, which is unless you have international cooperation and government action to tackle inequality and the sources of slow growth and get wages rising for most people, unless you do those things, our politics are going to continue to be sour. But I'm not a nationalist. I think it has to be done internationally. Yeah, yeah I was just going to quickly respond to that. And so I guess the point being, maybe you did the best that you could have done in the situation, but you are working within this neoliberal political economic system where year on year inequality is getting 
worse. And actually, we have to look at the system as a whole and reform it if actually we're going to get to a, a place where year on year things could get more equal. But, 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 because but, inequality but still grew well, in that. But in it that wasn't time a neoliberal period. economic system because we introduced a national minimum wage and tax credits, tougher competition policy, including fines on, um, on managers who, um, who, who were cartelizing. Okay, well, I mean, the great irony is that people on, the, uh, on one side of the left think that the new Labour government or the Labour government was um, you know, too right-wing and in hot to neoliberalism. Well, I know, and, you, and, and you can think that, and that's absolutely fine. All the time I was a government advisor and a minister, we were not attacked by the left for being too right-wing. We were continually attacked by the right for being too left-wing because they all believed that we were regulating too much, spending too much money, um, not... Um, be Sorry? Okay, so I was just answering the question, but okay. I didn't like quickly respond. So I think like... Let's get some more questions in, Frank. You can come back to okay. these. Um, I saw your hand first, sir, and then I'm going to go... Nobody on this side that I'm missing. You, sir, yes. Miss <coughs> Colin Bates. I'm um, president of the Wessex Regionalist Party. Been campaigning for 42 years to solve the major problem everyone faces, which is to get a democracy into this country and to have sovereign power distributed throughout the parishes. Because until we get that, it's painfully clear that our economic system is totally and utterly corrupt. It is irredeemably um, uh, rep reparable. Can I just and push you towards a question? Yes. So is there a question for the The question panel? is, would the panel not agree that until we remove, uh, re deconstruct, not reform, reform isn't an option, we deconstruct the existing government system, the existing finance system, and we make it democratic, and then we will have a chance of implementing the changes that positive money, uh, above all, wishes to put in, and that Thank Mr. You. Bowles has said he couldn't do it when he was in power and could, could have done. Thank you very much. Sir, I said I'd come to you next, and then there's a hand that's been waving frantically at me from the back. Yeah. Um, thanks. My name's uh, Frank. I work at the New Economics Foundation, formerly of Positive Money. I was wondering, Martin, it's always wonderful to hear you speak, by the way, and everybody else, by the way, you've done a great job. Um, if you could maybe expand on the benefits, or let's, let's put it this way, the blurs between sovereign money being a monetarist idea versus it being a post-Keynesian one, me being a post-Keynesian, and kind of wanting you to maybe expand towards Ed on, on, on the sovereign money post-Keynesian elements that there are to it, because it, in my opinion, it is not a monetarist idea. And I think it's, it's one of those kind of rebuttals that as somebody put forward this idea wants to kind of dispel. Great, um, we'll come to you on sovereign money in a second. There was one hand at the back. Yeah, you've got the mic, lovely. Hi. Um, yeah, someone alluded, it, uh, alluded to it over there. The crux of the real problem is the way money comes about, how it comes into being. And that is the banks are allowed to create it from nothing. They then tell the government to tell the people that you're borrowing, the government's borrowing, say, 100 billion from the Bank of England. You have to go back to the people. The people pay taxes. What would on, you change? On, what, well, what, what I would change? change is I would bring back the Bradbury Pan. Now, I've only spoke to one person that knows about the Bradbury Pan. The Bradbury Pan was introduced in 1914 by the Secretary of the uh, Treasury, John Bradbury, um, to prop up the, you know, the, the financial system because okay. we was going to go belly up. And bring that back, bring basic income in, and let's get rid of all the, all the, all the problems we face in society because, Ed, all you're doing is plugging and tinkering right. with a sinking ship. One last question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Sophia Morell, I'm chair of Labour in the city. Um, I wanted to um, raise the issue of pension fund capital and institutional capital, which doesn't seem to have come up yet much this evening. Um, McKinsey estimates that the global needs of infrastructure or UK needs of infrastructure will be 50 trillion by 2030, which exactly matches with the amount of pension capital and institutional capital we have which is obviously could be democratized by encouraging people to think about where their money is being invested and getting it flowing through our economy, investing back in development and infrastructure for everyone. Um, does the panel have any thoughts on that? Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to let um, Martin, you kick us off, if you don't mind, um, talking about sovereign money first of all, um, and then I'll bring in Ed 
and you get the last word, Dan, if that's yeah, all right. I'm, I hope you won't mind, and I'm sure you'll all understand it, there are lots of incredibly uh, wide-ranging and radical ideas that have been raised, all of which deserve about an hour each, and I don't have the hour, so I'm not going to be able to respond. Uh, you won't be surprised if there's a fair amount of what you said I don't agree with. Um, but that's all right, because that's part of the fun. Um, I want to make one preliminary point, which is, I think, related to Collins. And this is a matter of intellectual, what I regard of as intellectual cleanliness. I can't say more than this one point. Is It's really important, in my view, to try and separate out what are fiscal policy decisions from what are monetary policy decisions. Now, that's quite a difficult thing to do, but I think most of what you're after is a transformation of fiscal policy. Mon monetary policy can be used to support that, but it isn't fiscal policy. You don't want the central bank to decide how we deal with climate change. It's not its job. It's a fiscal, it's a government decision. So, and it's perfectly legitimate to ask how we should have used fiscal policy during the crisis. And I've had a very consistent position. We should have run larger deficit and invest them in infrastructure and borrow from pension funds. Um, the pension funds need a return, so for fairly obvious reasons. But so I believe fiscal policy is very important, but that's not the decision central banks should take. That's my little point, but there's lots of others. Now, the key point where I disagree with Ed, which is what you asked, I don't think, it is perfectly possible that you might be a um, Friedmanite monetarist, or actually it was Fisher before him and Marshall before that, very great British economist, by the way, who invented monetarism really, uh, Marsh, Marshall's K. Uh, so uh, 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 the quantity theory of money is a very old, old, old economic theory. You can believe in that or you might not believe it. I don't think that's relevant to whether you're in favor of sovereign money. Uh, because you could take the view that we want sovereign money, I, the government creates all the money. I won't go into the much deeper question about how you ensure that monopoly. That's a very deep question. I don't have time to go into that, I'm afraid, which Ed just raised. But you have sovereign money and you could decide, actually, the right monetary policy with sovereign money is to vary enormously growth of money from year to year. To, and it, so it would have nothing, none of the properties that Friedman had in mind. You could, the monetary policy you use in terms of how much you expand or shrink money from year to year is independent of how money is created. Okay, that's very important. At the moment, our decisions on how much money, we don't have a decision on how much money is created. Our decision on how to pursue monetary policy is, has no quantitative uh, goals, but it goes through a monetary system which has the characteristics we've discussed. I don't think there's any disagreement about that. It goes through a monetary system that has the characteristics we've discussed, and at the moment we happen to use it to target inflation, but we could do it some, something else. The essence of what we do if something like sovereign money were to work which is essentially to take away the capacity to create money by lending of the banking system or seriously modify it, is to ensure that a very specific but vital range of financial crises can't happen. And the specific and vital range of financial crises that can't happen are ones in which people panic because actually, if the financial system goes under, the ATMs all close, as Ed said, which is exactly what people were worried about in 2008. And then you're in Armageddon. So the aim of these proposals, as far as I'm concerned, you can think of two aims. One is to ensure we get away from Armageddon. That's not a sensible way to run a financial system. It's a moderate, modest proposal. And you can be a neo-Keynesian who believes you use monetary policy in that new system one way, you can be a monetarist who believes you use it in another way, but the essential point is the system you're using is robust. That's the point. Once you've done that, you can then get a separate discussion of, well, we've got this new monetary system regulated by the central bank. How should we use that in terms of the allocation of real resources in our country? And that is a completely legitimate debate between the left and right. Uh, on 
do you want to invest in, in a green revolution or something else? So I really disagree with Ed's description. It isn't monetarism in its technical aspect, but it is true that it was put forward by people who were monetarists. But their real concern is the same as yours. We, you know, you should often, this is my absolute last point on this, you should sometimes take, in my view, uh, uh, one, your enemies, I'm assuming from everybody here, your enemies, enemies' agreement with you when they have it. And the thing they agreed with you on is having a monetary system in which private institutions create money is wildly destabling, uh, destabilizing and corrupting. That's what the Chicago School thought. I happen to think they were right. I'll let you take on from that. <laughs> I'll answer that. If, um, in the debate between monetarists and Keynesians, Martin and I are both Keynesians, um, and there's no doubt about that. I am not saying that what Martin is advocating is a monetarist um, solution. What I'm saying is that the original idea came from the monetarists, and they thought it was a good idea because they thought two things. One, it would work in a simple way, and secondly, the free market system was equilibrating. They were neoliberal. Once those two things aren't true, actually, it's not easy. It's complicated, the monetary output relationship, and the economy's not uh, uh, self-equilibrating, uh, self which, which would be you know, either not neoliberal. Then it gets really complicated, and it's really hard. And all I was saying to Martin is, the people who originally advocated thought it was easy, and actually, this is very, very difficult. And the question is, is it more difficult than the alternative, which is to... Um, to regulate the way in which banks operate rather than trying to replace their role. And that's a, 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 a legitimate debate within the space of, uh, of Keynesianism. Now, there is one answer to the, um, it's really hard, and it's really hard because you've got banks and companies and people around the world, which is you know, a far left of centre version of take back control, where we just decide that we're gonna nationalise everything and control everything. And once you've done that, it's definitely much easier other than the fact that your economy probably runs into the ground and you don't innovate and you don't actually invest productively and you cut off from the rest of the world. And I don't think that's a very good idea. Now, there will be some people here who think that's a good idea. I've never thought the state taking control of everything, the, the allocation of, of, um, of, um, of assets is a good idea. And I think that you have to have pre private agents including institutions, including banks, which governments deal with. Now, you know, there may be people who think we shouldn't have any private institutions or banks or, uh, or kind of companies, but uh, I'm not in that world, so it's more, it's more uh, complicated. Um, the question then is, what do you do? And the answer is, neoliberalism is not the answer, because the monetarists are wrong, but I don't think one nation go it alone solutions are going to work either, whether they come from Donald Trump or whether they come from um, the far left. And therefore, the complicated thing is an international solution to inequality, growth, trade, and financial stability. And it's really difficult. And we can debate within that. There's a small bit of that debate, which is, is this a good idea? But it's a small part of a much bigger debate. And the only thing which worries me sometimes when I read the positive money stuff is that sometimes you give the impression this is going to solve most of our problems. And in fact, it's not going to solve hardly any of our problems. But it might solve a little bit. For those who didn't uh, get the question answered, don't think of this as the end of the session, but as the beginning of the drinks. So it can continue <laughs> with our guests uh, in a moment. But I'm going to let um, Fran Boyd wrap up this session. Fran, there's a lot of um, threads still. That I will leave to you to pull in a question about democracy, a question about the Burberry Pound, a question about um, <laughs> pensions as well. Um, but it's quite a big job. Then. It is okay. a big job. As um, I say, it's not the end. It's the beginning of the next bit. But if you want to um, give us your last thoughts, yeah, Fran, before I mean, we I agree with it. a lot of the points and questions, and I think there's a lot of uh, ex excitement and energy around community currencies. I know the point was made a while ago. We need a diverse monetary and banking system, and we need to uh, diversify ownership, like not necessarily keep it all in, well, it shouldn't be all in private or state hands. It should be a diverse new economy of multi-stakeholder public participants. I think like asset prices have been mentioned quite a few times in the, in the questions, and I think that the 
the conversation that UK isn't really happening now with Brexit is like, where do we want to go? Like, we need to understand that we are literally running the economy on asset price inflation and debt, and that is unsustainable, even more so with Brexit. And we do we want to double down and double the size of our financial sector through Brexit? I don't think most people in this country do. And so those are the kind of conversations we need to be having and raising with our MPs and saying, you know, the price of my house is going up, but my children won't be able to afford a, a house. And actually, they won't be able to get a job and they don't really want to work in the city because actually it's not really cool anymore because we know it's kind of evil. So <laughs> what do we want to do? And I think that... And I think that, you know, actually we're relaunching our evil. website. Are next. you sure about evil? I mean, we could get into the philosophy of say, evil if you, you want. want. to say evil? I think it's not this promoting the benefits the of society. The thing you've got to be slightly careful about here is that there are hundreds of thousands of people up. on £20,000 a year who work really hard and who work in the financial services industry. Do you want to call them all evil and say their jobs aren't worth something? I'm just not sure this is a good idea. I was trying well, to make okay. a point that I'm it's not, sure. not a massive industry I'm most people sure in this country oh. want. Loads of people in our country need a mortgage for their house. Okay. Can I and they need to save finish. fairly, and save in a pension. Jesus. It's not evil. Let Fran use the word evil and finish up, and you can take this one outside yeah. as we go. Okay, and I just wanted to end by saying, you know, I, I didn't want to get too much into the, uh, the positive money proposal because it is complicated. And actually, we're relaunching our website next week, and we're not going to say it's going to solve all the problems, but we know it's systematic. It's a system change. The whole system isn't working, and we're going to focus on the money and banking system. And we don't only need the Bank of England to start working in the, the public interest and not financial market interest, but we need uh, a diversity of banks. You know, we can't just have five stakeholder banks. We need... Uh, cooperative banks, regional banks, we could have nationalized RBS and broken it up. There are so many options out there, and at the moment, we're not really doing anything. And I think the point that I wanted to make, and the point I was kind of hoping that you two might respond to, which we can talk about afterwards, is like central banks are so powerful. And at the moment, and throughout history, they've only really been questioned by technocrats. And actually, we need to get them to put the public interest first. And there is an alternative to policies like QE, which are literally kicking the can down the road in terms of keeping asset prices high, but doing nothing for the rest of the economy. Um, and I think, it, I think I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you all very much indeed. And thank you for your questions. Thanks for coming.